right, so Dr. Tim, the reason why he asked for a little bit of permission, I, I apologize, is that when I got started on this, I, I decided I almost made a makeover out of it. So it's a three hour class, and uh, he sat down with me today, and he's like, uh, that's not going to work. So he sat down and pulled slide after slide after a slide out there. So I kind of feel a little bit naked, but that's okay. So I, uh, I appreciate you guys for being here. And I think for me, the, uh, the beautiful thing about this class is, is that, you know, when we start thinking about genes, like how many people know about genetics, by the way? Oh, yeah, just a little bit. We know that, like, you know, we can get them at Lucky's, and uh, but most of the time, like, you know, genetics is like such a like an overwhelming thing, and so we just think that, you know, Watson and Crick came out with this great idea. It's like called, um, you know, you are your genes, right? We had this huge ge human genome product uh, project, and what we we're going to do is we we're going to figure out the human genome, and we we're going to figure out all diseases, and uh, because we figured out all diseases, there would be no more problems in the future. Um, and I think that's the, the, the big challenge is, is that we, we, we then bought into this story that says that we are our genes and so we really have no choice about our future. Our, our destiny is, is, already, um, is, is already written for us. And so what, when I, the, the, with our, you know, this is raising healthy families, but really what I, my whole goal tonight is to teach you that lifestyle is the new genetics. Lifestyle is the new genetics. And a lot of times, you know, this is what most of us think about. We think about conception. We think about, you know, we're born, and then we kind of get a little bit older, and we go through, well, my daughter started high school today, so she's developing. Uh, we mature, I'm not going to ever do that. Uh, we decline, <laughs> and then we die, right? It's just, you know, it's, it, we, there's a simple process that goes on, and it just, we see it start replicating it time and time again. And really, you know, the, here's the thing I need you to understand, though, that death is inevitable, right? The death is inevitable. It's not going to... We, we can't escape that one, but really the end, our lifespan is really, um, it's up to us. It's like how we're going to live that. And I, and I love this because there's so many people, I love twins, so if anybody's a twin, I appreciate you. Uh, because you give us a really good idea of what that means, that they, they, you have identical genes, but what they find is, is that twins who have identical genes, they average about 10 years difference in the length of their life. And not only that, but they die of different causes. They don't usually die of the same causes there. So if we're our genes, why wouldn't twin, twins live the same length of life and die of the same type of thing? And, you know, this is, this, you know, they, there is a, I was reading an article that was in the New York Times just recently, and it was talking about these twins, and one is 96 years old, and the other is obviously 96 years old. And this one that's 96 years old, she literally goes out there and she, she drives all over the place. She goes to baseball games by herself. She plays, she's, you know, she's with her great-grandkids, she does everything, and then she has this other twin that's at home, and this twin at, that, that's at home is blind. She's got diabetes, she's got heart disease, um, she has dementia, she doesn't really remember who she is and what she's doing there. And you have these two polar opposites, but they had two totally different lives. And so, really, what I need to do is we're going to start at the basics here, and we're just going to build into a huge snowball. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this right here is an amoeba. So the cool thing about an amoeba is this, is that this, an amoeba, like, it's the simplest form, it's a, simple, it's a single cell, and what it does is, is, it, is it, uh, it, as, it's, it, as more amoebas are needed, as it ages, it actually splits. And then as it grows, it, then it splits again, and then it grows and it splits again. And so when they look at the, the, the DNA from an amoeba that from three billion years ago, it's identical to the amoebas that we have today. So there's no change in, in that amoeba, that, it literally, that, that amoeba never dies, that cell in that amoeba never dies. Which is pretty amazing when you think about it. It just keeps on replicating and replicating and replicating. And so, we're a little bit more complicated, right? Like, I mean, I think I'm a little bit more complicated. Um, I have arms and I have legs and I have different types of tissue. I have um, different types of, uh, uh, I have eyes and I have ears and I have a nose. So those are different types of cells there. And so, what, for that to happen, what has to, as those cells start to differentiate and they start to become different types of cells, there has to be a process in place. And so, God in His infinite wisdom created something called a stem cell. And you guys have probably heard of stem cell research, all the debate going back and forth. They're very similar to what we call the embryo cells because an embryo literally starts as, you know, a sperm and an egg becomes one single cell and then it starts to replicate. Well, these stem cells, they're our foundational cells because Today, you know, your stomach lining only lasts three days. Your, you know, your heart lasts 90 days. Your, um, your skin lasts two weeks. And so if we didn't have a way to create these cells, 
we would die really quickly. In fact, studies show that about 98% of us that is within us right now will not be within us three years from now. Those cells will totally disappear. Um, and every seven years, you're going to get a brand new skeleton. Every single cell that's in your skeleton in seven years is going to be completely replaced. I mean, and every, they, they estimate that our bodies will replicate themselves about 50 to 60 times in our lifetime, which is amazing. So what happens is these stem cells, what they do is they, um, they, they actually will, they can, they can change based on their environment to uh, like, a, like a nose, or they can change on their environment to a different type of cell. And so the, the, what happens though is, is that those cells that they change into die, but those stem cells never die. They keep on replicating themselves time and time and time again. And so if that was the case, we would think, oh my gosh, why we can live forever? Well, what ends up happening is they, there was a guy that is by the name of um, Hafleck. And back in 1962, he came up with this really kind of interesting experiment. He was wanted to figure out why that, that's, you know, what was going on with these cells. And he found that those cells replicated about 62 times 50 to 60 times in their lifetime, and then they ended up dying, and they ended up, because they died, because they, they started to mutate. Then the cells started to mutate, so we started to think they could only replicate so many times because after a certain amount of times, we get enough errors in the cells, and they just be kind of become the, 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 the dysfunctional cells, right? And then the body kills those cells. Well, what we found, that wasn't the case. We found that, there, that these cells have something in there called a, a telomerase, and this telomerase actually prolongs the life of those cells and how that works is this and this is what's really cool because you have to realize that when I when you start looking down on the cellular level that everything's already thought out like it's already pre-planned we don't have to kind of figure it out it was already handled from the beginning and so what happens is this is that on the cell that's replicating it replicates about 50 to 60 times 50 to 60 times and our uh, the, the stem cells will replicate about 50 to 60 times there's something called a telomere and a telomere is like a shoelace, okay? Think of like a shoelace is your DNA. And so on the end of the shoelace is that little plastic thing. And so every single time that you go to lace your shoe up, a little bit of that, uh, um, that plastic gets worn off. Eventually, all of it gets worn off and it, um, well, it starts to fray. Then how easy it is to lace your shoes? Have you ever tried that? You're like licking it and you're putting scotch tape on it. And, you know, finally you just kind of like, those are your home shoes. You walk around without any laces in. Well, that's what happens to our DNA is that the, those telomeres get worn down. Every single time a cell dies, the, the, telomere, the, the, the stem cell has to replicate more cells. And, um, and then what happens is, is that it gets to a point where it can't replicate anymore. And so that's when the stem cells die, and then our cells start to, you can't replace themselves, and that's what aging is. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm going to get a little heady today, so just if I go over something, um, talk to me after, or wave your hand and say, like, that didn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> uh, because I'm already thinking about 20 slides ahead, because I just can't wait to get some of that stuff. But what you have to understand is this, is that, that Lipton, he did, he did this really interesting experiment. So he took these stem cells, and what he did is he put them in a petri dish. So they're identical stem cells, exactly the same, but, you know, taken out of you or me or whatever, but they're the exact same genetically. And he took them, let them grow, and then he separated them and he put them into three different petri dishes. And as he was looking at those petri dishes, then he took different chemicals and different, and, uh, different fluids and changed the fluid that was in the petri dish, in each of those petri dishes. And, and in some petri dishes actually grew a bone cells. And in some petri dishes actually grew muscle cells, and in some petri dishes grew fat cells. What he did is he changed the environment of those stem, by changing the environment that those stem cells were in, he totally changed the type of cell that was created. You guys get how huge this is. So by changing the environment those, the cell was in, you change the type of cell that's created. So when they, now we go back to the telomere, so you change the environment, you get a different type of cells. Those cells are, are only have a certain lifespan. Our stem cells can keep replicating themselves, but watch this. Every single time that they replicate, they get a little bit off the plastic on the end. Well, the telomerase actually can regenerate that plastic or slow down. So that telomerase is actually, it, it's already in there. Um, the problem is, is that there's certain things called, like if you've heard of it, uh, uh, oxidation. I mean, like with like if you have a piece of metal, it's like it, when it rusts, that's oxidation. And when we have toxins in our body, 
and it creates oxidation. We have inflammation within our body, it creates oxidation. Well, those things actually cause our cells to die quicker, and so our stem cells have to replicate quicker, and so this, the lifespan of those cells shorten down. So our environment that we live in will determine how quickly our cells die, but will also determine how quickly our telomeres die, uh, are broken down. A telomere loses about 1% per year. Um, and that's what they're finding. It's about 1% per year that a telomere breaks down. So pretty much on average, the average person should live to 100. And like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard me say healthy to 100, right? I mean, that's, what, that's where it comes from. So that's, and so when in, his, in his experiment, we can take this and we can start looking about, okay, so how do we change our environment? We know that if we eat different, we, we should just feel different, right? Like we know that theoretically, if we eat in a certain way, we'll probably be a little bit healthier. Well, I'm gonna study rats. And I, some people like the tails, I have a hard time, that's why I cut the tail off of that other one. I just couldn't look at it, it was really kept curling around on the outside. But what they found with these rats was this is that there's a special type of rat, that, and then the th interesting thing about rats is genetically they're not very dissimilar from human beings, and um, you know, there's only a small percentage that's different, but with, with rats, what's interesting is there's a type of rat called an agouti mouse, uh, an agouti rat, um, and um, the, what the agouti rats do is they have this gene called the agouti gene that actually, as you can see, compared to a typical rat there, or mouse, they, they actually make them obese. It's just that it's, it's bred into them and it makes them obese. Um, and they're actually prone to heart disease and cancer and uh, diabetes. Go figure, right? So with these, what they did is they, they fed these, um, these, um, these, these, these agouti mice something with a diet and, and something called methyls. So it was just like a part of their diet. They just started feeding it to them. And what those methyls did, they went through the digestive tract and they went up to the brain and they attached to the gene in their, in, in their DNA that actually turns, the, 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 and what that did is those methyls actually flipped a switch, okay? And this is a big key because we, we think of our genes as just replicating, but we actually have about 28,000 genes. And what happens is, is that de depending on the environment that we're in, because those, those stem cells had the same genes as the nose cells, right, or the, the muscle cells, depending on the environment we're in, certain genes will turn on and certain genes will turn off. So what happened with it is it turned on those agouti genes, and when the agouti gene turned on, all of it, I mean, it, it, it actually suppressed the activity of that gene. So all of a sudden, those agouti, those agouti mice actually became thin, which is kind of interesting. Like, it, they're genetically fat. They're genetically obese genes, but by changing their diet, you actually change their whole genetic code and their expression uh, and, and their whole, what they look like there. Uh, what was interesting, they also then injected them with something that actually took away the methyl and guess what happened to the mice? Okay. They went got fat again. And so what happens is the, the key I need you to keep understanding and I keep repeating back to you our environment, that the environment that our cells are in will determine how our genes express themselves. Same thing by the way is true in human beings. Go figure. Check this out. This is uh, Dean Ornish. Kind of looks a little scary right there. <laughs> you guys have heard of him. You've seen him. He's on TV all the time. But he actually is like one of the the old timers as far as like, you know, nutrition and, 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 and what he did is he actually said, okay, let's see if this makes a difference. Well, he totally just changed, took these people that were high risk for prostate cancer and were actually pretty sick people. And they, they spent an hour a day in stress reduction. They changed their diet. Um, they, they started exercising, just a little walking there. And what he found is, is and after, after they, I think they were there for, um, I, it was three months, right? Um, and with, look at this. They had 40, 453 genes had been turned off. That means that every single time those cells replicated, they were a totally different type of cell. Like they were making a new human being. Imagine if, you know, we have 10% of our gene, I mean, a, you know, a percentage of our genes turning off. They had 501 genes were triggered by just changing their lifestyle, right? And so we can totally change who we are by changing our lifestyle, and that is, that is the big key. This is beautiful. Norm Shelley did the same type of thing. Look at this. Our cells age about 1% one one shorter each year. As we look at it, the, the more unhealthy habits that we have, our telomeres will shrink. Remember, that's the thing that keeps our cells replicating. What he did, after three months, he just changed their diet, and what he found out is, is that actually the telomeres didn't get really shorter, they actually started to lengthen. So do you realize the power in this? 
that you actually, by changing your diet, you're actually able to lengthen the time that you're actually going to be able to make new cells. You're literally able to stop aging in this process. Right in its tracks there. After 10 months, they were almost 3% longer. So they changed their diet for 10 months. They got three years longer of their life. Wow. How cool is that? I mean, that's, I mean, and that's amazing to me. And so when we're talking about the five essentials, when we're talking about nutritional changes, it's not about weight loss, right? It's about changing that internal environment. By changing that internal environment, we change our genetic expression, and that's how we get a longer life there. We hear me talking about um, omega-3s all the time. I mean, I'm a big omega-3 fan, but this is just, you know, basically, when they, they tested people, they had like 5,000 or 600 people on this uh, uh, test, because it's kind of expensive to test a telomere, you know? Um, but what they, what they found was is that the people that were taking omega-3s was the, it, it slowed the rate of the telomeres from breaking down there. Maybe it was not just slowing the rate of the telomeres, but it was slowing the rate of the cells from dying so the telomeres didn't have to keep replacing themselves. So what we have to look at is, is that, it, and one of the things about omega-3s is it reduces inflammation so much. So when we have an inflamed cell, what it does, that cell is going to die quicker and that cell has to re replicate itself there. But this right here is the, this is the manna. This is what this is this is what I need. This is the most important thing. You probably don't need to go read this book, Pattern Formation of the Physiologic and Biologic Sciences. My wife was like, "Are you really reading that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, really, I am." And she thinks that I was crazy. But the beautiful thing about this is, is the, when he said it, it's a signal from our environment that activates the expression of the gene. So how does this work? What can, what, when, how does our in body detect a signal through our, from our environment? Any ideas? But it, well, it comes from the nervous system, right? Like our, our, every single part of our body is controlled by the nervous system. And the way that we know whether it's hot or cold on, or if it's something smells good or bad, if our, we're under stress, is through our nervous system. Basically what they said was is that the nervous system takes in information from our environment goes up to the brain, and the brain is the regulator of genetic expression. What they said was that the brain was the regulator of genetic expression because what the brain does is it changes the petri dish. It changes the fluids with which those cells are exposed to on a regular basis based on the signals that it's getting. So then what it does is it sends messages down those nerves out to every single tissue in your organ to work in a coordinated fashion to create a perfect environment so that you can grow a new muscle so that you can grow a new bone, and so that you can grow a new stomach lining perfectly every single time. And that's the power of this, is that it's the, it's the brain that is actually controlling all the fluids in your internal environment that allows those stem cells to actually become you, to become your eyeball, to become your tongue, and I don't know, to become your hair. I, I don't know if I can help hair, but... Uh, <laughs> and so, not only does the brain control those things, but what we have to realize is, is that, you know, this is a beautiful quote by Gandhi. And this is one of my, um, you know, I have this up on my wall at home. It says, you believe you should become your thoughts. Because what we do know is this, is that not only is our, the, the important thing about our, our environment, but it's how we perceive our environment. So the thoughts that we have on a daily basis they're going to be, uh, the, the beliefs that we have right now are going to determine our thoughts. If we think that we're not going to be able to make changes, uh, that, you know, I'm just getting old and this is the way that it has to be, well, they're going to, we're going to start having these thoughts, we're going, to start, we're going to start speaking these words aloud, we're going to start taking action, which are, you know, if, if we think that, you know, there's nothing I can do, I had a, a lady that was 104, she was my oldest patient, and she was, you know, the reason why she was here is that she wanted to get healthy. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was it. She's, she's got I got a long ways to go, and I don't want to like you know break down at this point. <laughs> I have people that come in and they're 50 and they've already given up. They're like you know I've already you know my mom died when she was 65, my dad died at 40, and you know I'm right on my way out there. So what do you think that person's actions are going to be like? They're going to be commensurate with what our thoughts and our beliefs are. And so my whole goal today is to change your beliefs and to realize that how amazing and incredible that you are and what the potential that lies within inside of you. Because when you change your actions, you're going to change your habits. And when we change our habits, we start changing our values of what's important to us. And then what happens when we change our values? We change our destiny. And so the, you have to remember that each of you has your own destiny 
right in your hand. You can get all the tools that's on the inside of you, and it all starts with our thoughts. And what we have to realize is that one of the biggest things that happens is this, is that you know, what is the biggest thing that we, you know, we're exposed to on a daily basis that will change our physiology? It's stress, right? And there's, there's, there's two types of physiology. There's what we call a stress physiology, and then there's a love physiology. You know, like when you're, when you're trying to, and, and what, the way that it happens is this, is that when we're in a stress physiology, your body will sacrifice, it'll change an environment to sacrifice the future for right now. But when we're in a love physiology, like we do things for people that we're in love with that, that don't even benefit us whatsoever, right? We, we just, we do it because it's the right thing to do. And so when our body's in a, a, a love physiology, all of a sudden it's in this rest and digest place. It's in this place of growth. And so you want to think of when our body's in a relaxed growth love state, or it can be in this stress fight or flight state. And so the physiologies are totally, different, totally mutually exclusive. You cannot be in a love physiology or a growth physiology and be in a stress physiology at the same time. It's impossible. You can't be in love with somebody and being afraid that they're going to leave you, right? It just doesn't work like that. So those physiologies are totally different, and the genetic expression of those physiologies are different too. But one of the things that we, have, we realize is that we can change our physiology, we can change our thoughts, and I love this study because what they did is they took a whole bunch of old guys that were stuck in a retirement home. And they were literally just wasting away in this retirement home. And if you look at the statistics on it, it's pretty amazing because they took a whole battery of tests that said, um, you know, they, they did mental tests and they did physical tests on them to actually find out what their you know, mental and physical age was and what their impairments were. And then what they did is they took them out of that environment and they stuck them in this little like retreat center. And they created this whole retreat center to look like it was 1959. The men wore the, the same clothes that they wore in 1959. All the labels on all the food were the exact same as it was in 1959. All the, the music was the same as 1959. They had newspapers that were printed like it was 1959. And what they did is they found that within a few days of living mentally in the past, living as if they were younger, what they found was there was the, the people that had symptoms of like, you know, like dementia, and all these mental disorder, like mental issues that were going on, these physical issues, their blood pressure went down, their, their, a lot of their, their symptoms, their aches and their pains, most of them stopped using their walkers and their wheelchairs during this time. They actually became younger just by changing their thought process. Now imagine if we had left them in that environment and, and changed, their, changed their thought process for long enough, because remember, our brain creates our physiology. What, kind, what do you think would start to happen to the cells in their body? they'd have start having younger cells. Their telomeres would start to lengthen. The their ability of their body to replicate new and healthy cells would, would, would change there. And so that's what it comes down to, is you know, a lot of times we think it's a, it's a battle of nature versus nurture, and, and I believe it is. Um, nature is a constant, nurture is the variable there. Nature is, it was, is, it was, it was given to us in one way. And, and in this study, what they looked at was that our, our brains are very plastic, meaning that they will adapt to any, ch in any stimulus, and the more that we have a particular stimulus, or lack thereof, our brains will adapt around that. And what that means is this. They took these, these, these rats, and what they did is they, they looked at, there was two groups of rats. One, well, the mothers would actually nurture the children, and they'd nurse them, and they'd take care of them, and the, the other group of rats wouldn't do anything with their children. They would have nothing to do with those, their children whatsoever. And what they found is that, that in the, and the, and, the, and the rats that, were, uh, that, that, that weren't nurtured, their stress state, their reactivity to any single stress that they have was so much higher. They literally lived in a stress or fear physiology because that their brain hadn't been patterned in that nurturing place. They hadn't grown up in that love place there. And what they found was that there's a, these acetals, they, they actually turned the, 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 the genes on for that stress physiology. Um, so the rats that had, were nurtured by their mothers had a much better ability to handle stress. What they ended up doing in the rats that, um, that, that had, had this stress physiology that hadn't been nurtured, they actually gave them acetals. They actually injected them with acetals and their whole stress response changed be, over time be, and because their genes started to change there. And then they also went into the nurtured rats and they injected them with something that actually removed the acetals from there and their, their genes changed and they went into a stress state. And then they took the ones that were in the stress state, they re-injected the acetals in there, and they went back into that, that state where there was no fear there. Kind of interesting, isn't it? 
And so we look at that, it, it starts in childhood, and you know, and, and, it, and our brain will change that physiology. I mean, it, I mean, you guys know about this, our, our environment, our mental environment is such a powerful thing. You know, children that were traumatized as, as, as children, you know, they have higher rates of disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, bone fractures, because, you know, when we're in a stress physiology, we don't think about the future. Like, it's, it's about survival right this second. And that's what our body thinks about. It thinks about surviving right this second. It doesn't think about a hundred years in the future, and so it doesn't create, it doesn't care about healing diabetes. It doesn't create about creating an environment to make sure we don't get diabetes. It makes, it means that we, it creates an environment that is this, that just to get us through today. Environment's everything. So badly nurtured children had the same ability that they, they found in the study as those rats that were badly nurtured at the same time. It affected how their brains perceived their environment. They grew up in a stressed state. Now, and even when you look at something like depression, you know, depression's epidemic right now. But even with depression, they find that like people that, that have depression have 200 genes that have been flipped or turned off as opposed to people that don't have depression. And you know, the problem is, is these are the same genes that regulate our immune system. They're the same genes that, uh, that, re that decrease our response to inflammation. I mean, they, they decrease inflammation in our body and we, we, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, this is heavy, right? You know, the, you know, I, you know, I had a, a tough time as a kid, and, and I, you know, how am I powerless to change this? Well, I think the thing that uh, this is one last one that I'm going to drive it home at this point. But look, they, they also looked at people that had depression, or they, or like a feeling of what we call hopelessness, or they had anger. And what was interesting, they followed these people over 20 years, and what they found is that 75% of the people over 20 years ended up with cancer. 75% of the people that just had a hopelessness, I can't do anything. 75% that were angry ended up getting heart disease. 15% of them had depression and heart disease. So 90% of all the people who died of cancer or heart disease had anger or depression there. It's that stress physiology that we're talking about that changes our internal environment, that changes our genetic expression, and has our body age at a different level. The people with the, the lifelong depression, when they were looking at this study, it changed their environment so much that, that they actually died on average about 35 years earlier than people that were happy, that were in that growth physiology there. I mean, we have to look about, are we gonna keep walking for ribbons, right? Is it, is it about the ribbon and waiting till somebody gets cancer? Or do, what, if we had done, what if we had like, worked with somebody uh, 20 years before, before they had to have a ribbon, before we had to walk with their sign there? So hopefully you understand by now stress is real. And many times it comes from childhood. It compounds day in and day out. It fluctuates the year to year. I know when we have kids, it goes up through the roof. You know, you have your great times, you have your stress times there too. But you know, we look seventy percent of the seventy ninety percent of all visits to the doctors are actually because of stress there too. I mean, who the World Health Organization defines it as a, as an epidemic. And even I see this in here, because look at this: when we're under stress. What happens to your muscles? They get tight, right? So, they, you, I mean, any disagreement with that, right? Like, I mean, oh, I got these stressed shoulders, I got a stressed headache, I got a, you know. Well, what happens is, is that when you're under stress, if I walk up behind you, I go, boom! Like, your, your muscles are going to, you don't know I'm coming. Right? That was going to, let's try it again. Boom! There we go. Uh, what happens is your muscles are going to get tight. Well, in, when those muscles get tight, they have a very special cell called a spindle cell fiber in there. So in your, uh, in your uh, like in your leg right here, this rectus femoris, you have about 50 of them per gram. In the muscles in your neck, you have about 500 of them per gram. So imagine what's going to happen. Somebody's just theoretically says that somebody's working in a computer company. And they sit in front of a computer all day long under stress, right, in this position. And they, the muscles get tight while they're under stress all day long locking that spine into place. Well, the challenge with that is this. I mean, I don't, I, you might know somebody like that, but uh, <laughs> what happens is, is that what it does is that, that position that it locks them into, it creates subluxations. And so what we find out is many times is subluxations are not the cause, but they're an effect of this prolonged stress here. And we know that when somebody has a subluxation, which is a, a, a form of nerve interference, and 
how our body perceives the world through our nervous system. So by, as the information is coming up into our brain, it's being interfered with. So we're getting garbled information as it's coming down from the brain, it's getting interfered with. So all of a sudden, the environment that our cells find themselves in is totally inappropriate for the environmental stimuli. And all of a sudden, that's why when we find when somebody gets adjusted, their whole life changes. They start to, their, their body starts to heal because all of a sudden now their body can regulate that internal petri dish. I mean, we're just petri dishes covered with skin. Don't forget that. <laughs> Maybe I should, I should just get a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> so, uh, one of the cool things is, is that you gotta learn to chill out, right? We're all wound tighter than a drum. Like every single person is like, you know, they, something happens and we just react to it. And, and I think the thing that was beautiful is they found that when they, they just taught people to relax, have you guys ever done this, that, that relaxation technique where you're laying in bed and you can't go to sleep? My mom used to teach this to me. Or you, you tighten up your toes and you hold them, and then you relax. Then you tighten up your feet, you hold them, and then you relax. Then you tighten up your calves as much as you can, hold them and relax. And then you kind of work your way through your whole body. Um, all, that's all they had them do. And what they found was, just by doing that, they found that they turned off the genes just by relaxation that were leading to a lot of the inf inflammation and it, your bodies were able to handle free radicals which were damaging their DNA better. Just by tightening up those muscles and relaxing. How cool is that? So, I mean, maybe consciously tighten your muscles, not subconsciously. Um, <laughs> but here's some of the things that we find that, you know, to, we, to create what I call an, an emotional love nest. Uh, I put the nest up there just to remind you. But some of these things, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's power in prayer. Like, you, you spend time talking with your God, things are going to get better. You start looking at meditation, you know, optimism, having a positive mental attitude, and, and seeing things in a different way, and speaking those words that, uh, as you want to see them. We start looking at our beliefs, you know, having beliefs, you know, we have beliefs that are either they're, they support us or they break us down. And, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges that I have in here, is breaking through people's beliefs about themselves, and what they can and cannot do, and that, you know, I spend more time, honestly, we have one-on-one -on -one in rooms arguing with people about their limitations. No, I can't do this. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, I can. No, I can't. So start looking at those beliefs that support us. You know, visualizing. Visualizing and starting to see things. Because a lot of times, most of us don't even think about our day until it happens. And then we think backwards. Like, but you can't change it once it's happened, right? Also looking at acts of kindness. When you give love, what do you get? Oh, you get love and nurturing, and so what does that do to your physiology and your genetic expression there? And, you know, love, and, and so I think you know, if you never got love as a child and you didn't get nurtured, well, I, I was in church once, and, the, and the, I, I've told this story several times, but the priest said, uh, walked up to this little kid, he's like, give me M&Ms. And the kid's like, I don't have them. He's like, I want M&Ms. He's like, I don't have them. And he goes, and he reached in his pocket, and he handed him a bag of M&Ms, and he goes, can I have some M&Ms? And the kid was able to give M&Ms back. Like, you can't give what you don't have, right? And so, or you can't expect when somebody doesn't have something. So the more you give out, it's going to come back to you without a thought there. Here's some, you know, some other things that we can do. I mean, look at this. You know, we have 27, uh, was it 23,000 sites on our, 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 our genome, like our, on our genes. Uh, we have 27,000 different genes. On that, almost 10% of them have, have binding sites that is absolutely essential that you have vitamin D for. Those genes cannot express themselves if you don't have vitamin D on those, on those sites. So you notice I sneak vitamin D in every single time. <laughs> every single time I'm going to put it in there because it is so powerful. And this is a, in Science Daily, this guy came out and he, and he basically said that vitamin D is probably one of the biggest things that's had an, an effect on our genes in recent times. Because before we were out in the sun, but now, because we're not in the sun, it's created so many other problems there. So, I mean, that's why you start thinking about, like, what happens with our, with our, you know, our genes? Oh, you have the, the, the bad heart gene. No, you, your, your genes are changing based on what's happening there. These are some of the things that, you know, vitamin D affects. But forget about those things. Why wait till we have those things? Let's let our genes actually do what they're supposed to be doing there. So... I guess the, this is kind of a, a, an important thing, and I want you guys to think about this. And this is a, a, a big one for me because, you know, we talked about 98% of our body in three years isn't going to be there. That means 98% of the atoms in our body aren't going to be there in three years. Like, 98% uh, of everything who we are isn't going to be there. So, where do the new atoms come from? Food. From the food we eat, right? 
So just think about that. Like three years from now, you know, if you make if you make changes in your lifestyle right now, what's your body going to look like in three years from now? Like most people, like the the hardest thing is somebody will be like, oh, I started the the advanced plan. It was I just. It was just too hard, and I didn't see any changes after a week. <laughs> so, like, you got, like, maybe, I don't know, 1% of 1% of all your atoms changed. Good. Congratulations. I mean, that's better than we were, but what we have to look about is this is a lifestyle. It's like, you know, the advanced plan is not there just to, to make you lose weight or to treat something there. The advanced plan is there to replace your atoms with healthy atoms so that you can have a healthy you. And so you're going to have a totally different genetic expression there. And so... Really, this is what I need you to understand in moving forward because there's a lot of struggles that we have um, in, with changing our eating patterns. They're, they're a habit. Many times, uh, the way that we eat is what we call a pacification for stress because stress looks like this. It used to be the, uh, the fight or flight response. You guys have heard of that. But it's actually, it's not the fight or flight response. It's the, it's the freeze, the deer in the headlights look, the, the flight, which means run, or the fight response. Now, we can't really... You know, and that's why like, you, when you're at work and you have a whole bunch of work and you get overwhelmed, what do you do? Nothing, right? You just kind of like go get a cup of coffee, go talk to people, and it just piles up. You put it in your bag at the end of the day, you carry it home at the end of the day, you carry it back the next day, you check Facebook when you get into work. You know, we're frozen, we haven't done anything. Then what starts to happen is, is that you, it gets so bad that we, we, we flight. Well, I don't really like this job, I'm going to go to another job. And, and then the next thing is, is that, you know, we have the fight. Like, we don't, can't punch paperwork, right? We, what we do is we, we just like, get angry at people. We get angry at the job, we get angry at the environment, we get angry at the people, the people around us bother us. And you have to realize this is an ingrained part of who we are. This is neurologic, this is who we are. And so obviously the first thing is if you find yourself frozen, ask yourself what's really going on here. You know, just, just say what's going on here. Um, and, and say, okay, what can I do right now to offload this? If, if you're in that frozen state, make those changes. But what we, when, we, when it comes to our food, most people get frozen because making a change is scary uh, sometimes. You know, we, we see it as denial. We see that we can't have this or, you know, it's, it's just too hard or, you know, I've never been able to do it before. So what we impact is how we feel. I mean, what we, what, what we eat impacts how we feel. How we feel impacts how we eat. Okay? Or how we think, sorry. So if you got stinking thinking, right? Well, what you have to look at is what you ate to get stinking thinking. So it's, it's kind of hard to change. Do you see this vicious cycle? Like, you can't change the way that you're thinking with the way that you're eating, and you can't change the way that you're eating with the way that you're thinking. And um, so what, what we have to look at is, is what we eat impacts how we think. It, it, it impacts who we are. It impacts how we make decisions in our life. It impacts how we adapt to stress. It impacts every single thing that is important. And it impacts our destiny. It impacts our destiny. And literally, what we have to look at when we're eating is this, is that um, when the, you know, every single thing that, that we put into our mouth, we have to look at it as this. This, what I'm putting in my mouth right now, is going to change my internal environment. It's going to change my, 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 my genetic expression. It's going to change my health. But not only is it going to change my health, literally it's going to change my destiny. And you have to, you have to realize it has to have that type of power there. You get it? Right? I mean, this is, this is big. Like, what we eat impacts how we feel. How we feel impacts how we think. And what we eat impacts how we think. So this is, this is extremely powerful. The problem is, is that we've been brainwashed. I mean, I'm going to run through this, but, you know, 73, one in five foods on TV tells us that we need to eat fast food. Uh, there's 5.2 fast food, food ads prevented, presented every hour, and 80% of the drug ads, every, and there's 80 drug ads, uh, drug ads every hour on TV. Check this out. 20% of the available food in this country is actually real food. 80% of it's processed food. So how do you think we're going to think? We're going to have processed thinking there. Real fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, they're not processed, but 60% of the food in the grocery store is processed. It's in a package. So it's going to affect how we think. 45% of all food consumed in the country comes from McDonald's. Ew. Oh, wow. Ew. Look at that. 45% of all the food in the country comes from McDonald's and other fast food restaurants, and 99% of their food is obviously junk. Um, eating the American way doesn't allow us for proper thinking. 
It doesn't allow us for making proper decisions. I mean, imagine you're taking a, a, a processed food, putting it into your body, changing your internal environment. Your body's going to see that as a stress, and it's going to immediately put you into a stress physiology. And then when you're in a stress physiology, you don't make logical decisions. You make survival decisions. You make a decision based on what your next meal is, not on what your destiny is there. The other thing is we have to eat for energy. Food is equal to energy, okay? And I, the, the, over at Eastern State University, they did this study, and I thought this was in interesting. They looked at um, that, that everything has a frequency because we're all energy. I mean, literally, we got atoms and protons and neutrons, and I mean, we're just made up of just a, a bunch of energy, right? And you go back to that, you know, you have your gluons and your quarks, and but we're just every single part of us has a frequency. And so they look at the they study the brain of a genius. It's running around, uh, you know. Uh, 80 to, 80 to 82. You look at the human body on average, it's running around 62 to 78 there. Um, you look at the heart, it runs about 67 to 70. Well, you look at, when they look at somebody that has a, at the start of a cold or flu, they're 57 to 60. Death begins, they, they start when somebody, their frequency is running around 25, that's where death begins. But look at this, fresh food has a frequency, if fresh food has a frequency of about 20 to 27, what do you think, like, uh, the, if you have an apple, or you have a potato chip, which has a higher frequency, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. Like, one's gonna, like, like the, that, I mean, look, we're just barely pushing over the death frequency there. What if we load ourselves with something with a five or 10 frequency there? Oh. Every single day, we're bringing our frequency down. We're bringing ourselves closer. We have to think about our food as a, what we call a food value. Okay, it has a food energy <coughs> value, and you have to look at that. So not only it, it, it's yeah, the food can take you to your destiny, but if it's not, it does, if it doesn't have an energy value, it's not going to build you up there, and it's going to bring, it's going to weaken your body there. That's why when you start looking, like, you know, we talk about toxic meat all the time, right? Like you have two choices: you have grass-fed beef, or you have toxic meat. Toxic meat takes five to eight pounds of chemically sprayed for, uh, of, of grain to produce one pound of beef. Where does that chemical go? Right in there. Is the chemical going to increase your energy value as a toxin, or is it going to decrease it? Decrease. Yeah. Sometimes or every time. Every. every yeah. Every single time. On average, you have like a glass of inorganic store-bought milk contains a residue of about a hundred different antibiotics. What's the energy value on that? Is it going to put your body in a stress state or a growth state? Yes. And it's, it, now it's going to change your physiology to a stress physiology, change that petri dish in there. Those <laughs> cells are going to just respond. They're not saying, oh wait, no, this is the wrong physiology, this is the wrong fluid that I'm in here. No, they're just going to be like, oh, I'm just a stem cell, I just replicate all day. You know what I mean? And so, how about water? I remember water is one of those easiest things. Just, I mean, do not drink. I mean, we remember like our, a couple classes ago, I was talking about like they found uranium samples in you know San Jose water. Like we were going over that when I gave that reference to that website. Don't drink city water. I mean, maybe water your plants with it if you don't like your plants. <laughs> but I mean, the, the biggest thing is it's got a you know bio weapon in there. It's got chlorine in there. I mean. Chlorine banned outside of our water supply, why would you put it on the inside of our water supply? Make sure you get a water filter that's able to take that chlorine out of there. Um, you know, teas are good. You know, even black tea is okay. Green tea. And the biggest thing, you know, I look at coffee, like energy value, yeah, like it, it gives you energy, but does it have energy value? Right? Like, how do you feel when the coffee wears off? Right? I mean, nobody ever feels, oh, I'm so refreshed after my coffee and caffeine <laughs> wearing up, right? It doesn't happen like that. So, I just wanted to throw this in for you guys. There's, you know, what they call Gano coffee, which is made of red mushrooms there. It's been around for only about 4,000 years. People have been drinking it. Seems to work pretty good. Uh, you're good if you have that because, once again, it's a live food. I mean, it was something that man, that, that God created, not man. Um, so, it seems to work pretty good there. How about this? Um, the number of minutes watched in TV, and I'm gonna. This is crazy. You know, I'll just average it down. The average child watches about 28 hours a week of television. 28. I think the average amount of time that they spend talking with their parents is about 3.5. So who's gonna have a greater influence on them? The 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 80 drug ads that they see per hour, and the five fast food ads that they see per hour, or their parents? So as a parent, we just have to really look at you know where there, our children are getting in their information because, and then you have to also look at the type of uh, programs or the are the programs that they're watching, creating their. Remember, we talked about the brain is plastic; it's very adaptable and it'll change. You know, when they're watching things that are death and destruction on TV, what we're doing is we're programming their brain for a stress physiology. 
Percentage of four to six year olds when asked to choose between watching TV and spending time with their fa fathers, survey says, 54%. Half the kids would rather watch TV than spend time with their dad. That's sad. But the crazy thing is this, is by the time we get to uh, 65 years old, the average American right now is spending about nine years of their life glued in front of the TV. Nine years, like being brainwashed on a daily basis and, 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 and actually being sedentary. And remember, we are created to move, we're created to, to eat, and we're created to, 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 to live and to love. And none of those things happen in front of the TV unless you're eating on top of the TV and uh, <laughs> that's your center table there. So I think the big thing is, is let's get off the couch, stop watching sports, and actually start doing them. I mean, I, I can't, I, I mean, nobody can argue with me that, like, like exercising will help you lose weight, right? Pretty good idea. Strengthens our immune system. Yeah, we've had classes on that. Aids in natural detoxification? Absolutely. How do you think that's going to change our internal environment? Blow it away. Uh, simulates healthy neurologic response. Is that important? Yeah, because that's how we perceive our environments through our nervous system. And so if we're having stimulating healthy, uh, healthy nervous system, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have the best chance of being able to have a healthy internal environment. And that's why when they start looking at people that actually do a relatively brief amount of exercise, what it did, it stimulated the growth factor genes. It's the, 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 remember we talked about there's the fight or flight genes? It stimulated the, those, those genes that actually create growth in our body. It stimulated the growth hormone. It stimulated us to be in that rest, digest, love physiology. And what they found was is that the people that did long-term exercise, like they, they, they ran marathons on a regular basis, they, you know, they, they went and they, they worked out for three hours at a time. What they found is it also stimulated genes, it actually stimulated the inflammatory genes, creating in, inflammation throughout their body. And that's why when they start looking at like marathon runners, compared to the average population, they're more likely to have a heart attack. Who would have thought? Or you look at Jim Fix, who's the father of modern running, what did he die of? Heart attack. We start looking at our chemical burden. So what if we did everything perfect and we just lived in this world that we're in right now? We ate perfect. We had a positive mental attitude. We, we actually meditated and we prayed and we did origami all day. I don't know. But <laughs> what happens is, is that the average person on a daily basis is exposed to over 300 different chemicals. We're exposed to over 300 different chemicals from the moment that we get up. And you guys remember the video that I, they made at the last makeover? Like where we just went through, like just like in the, the first part of my day before I even left the house, I mean, I was just like sopping in chemicals. Where do those chemicals go? They go into our body. What happens when they go into our body? They change our environment on the inside of the body. And most of the chemicals, they stay in our body. And so our brain is like saying, I know what to do based on what's happening here. And then all of a sudden, you're going in there and changing that environment, and the brain's like, what the heck is going on here? And it, it, there's this constant battle. Your body will never balance out. There will ne you'll never be able to get that health that you want. Neurotoxins, and it's not just us right now. There's a study called 10 Americans, and they basically found that when they studied the umbilical cord blood samples of children just born, 287 chemicals were detected in umbilical cord blood. Of those, 180 were known to cause cancer, and 217 are toxic to our brain and nervous system. Wow. 217 ones that are toxic to the brain and the nervous system, the thing that's in charge of regulating our, our, our internal environment and our genetic expression. I mean, we don't, you're looking at that, it gets overwhelming. It's like we don't even have a chance. But we do because we have choice. We have choice about the things that we